Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me this morning back to Matthew chapter 28. I told you that I would probably read this throughout this series just for the foundation of it. Let you know that where we're going, what we'll be studying on, is this is microphone. Praise the Lord. I'll preach through it till we till it goes out, I guess. Praise God. Wherever you've come from this morning, it's good to have you. No matter where you come from, it's good to have you. Amen. Praise God. Sounds good for me. Matthew chapter 28. Stand on your feet this morning. We're dealing with disciple. Not just discipleship, but what it means to be a disciple. For eight weeks, starting today, last week was kind of the preface to the day. And for the next eight weeks. But today I want to deal with... The word, or, you know, the word disciple has eight letters in it. That's why I chose eight weeks. Eight letters. D-I-S-C-I-P-L-E. Eight letters. Each of them, I feel like, is significant to the word, to the position, to the calling of a disciple. And through the help and grace of God for the next eight weeks, we're going to ex explore each of those letters in the word disciple. Today, obviously, we're starting with D. Two subjects that are so, there's so much real estate between these two subjects. I found it very difficult, it was very difficult this week to study, but I'm just moving under the inspiration of God and how He wants me to do this. So it took some, it took some digging and it took some thought and prayer to, to, to bind these two things together to make them work. Uh, for this at least for the next 30 or 45 minutes but the word we're going to be dealing with today two words we're going to be dealing with is disengagement and destiny disengage and destiny or you could say detached detached disengaged but destiny your bible in your hand i want you to look at matthew chapter 28 is our theme throughout this series. I'll read this every time. Verse 16. Do you have it? Say amen. amen. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain in which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. I'm not going to say that everybody's going to get this. Some may leave here doubting. That's your, pure, that's your prerogative. That's your choice. But Jesus is real, He's calling, He's saving, He's healing. Amen. And if you choose not to embrace that, that is your decision. Amen. But at least it is available. Amen. And we're going to make it available. God has made it available. Amen. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority. Everybody say, All authority. All authority. Did He say some? All. Did He say a little? All. Did He say a lot? All, inclusive, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. You may be seated here today. We're going to talk about disengagement. We're going to talk about destiny. These two things are miles apart when it comes to the thought that you may have of them. And you may say even now, early on, disengaging and destiny, man, there is a lot of spiritual real estate in between them two words. Because it, it promotes the thought of a beginning, a new beginning, and an ending. The word destiny is a very interesting word. It is at times, I think, uh, plundered with until it is spiritualized beyond belief. 
But destiny is, and predestination is a doctrine in the Word of God. And everybody in here needs to understand that there is a destiny for our lives. But when God calling you into that destiny, let me just say this before we get started with detachment or disengaging. That'll be my first thought today. Before God can, and as He takes you through and to your destiny, our final destiny, I believe, is heaven itself. Would you agree? I believe destiny has to be summed up with the idea that though we have some destined places upon this earth and destinies when it comes to relationship, people, ministries, etc. I believe that the final destination is heaven. I believe that in here is the place of bliss and blessing where everything that you've ever believed will consummate in the seeing and the sight and the seeing of Jesus and the sights that he has created for each of us who decide to be a disciple of his. Amen. amen. Say amen again. Amen. Are you with me this morning? Amen. So destiny is one of those words that I think at times we have, we have assumed way too much. But in the same token, we have not dove into it way too often as we should. But I do believe that there is a plan for every person that God has brought into creation. But in that plan, I want you to hear me very good. When God destines you, and there is a destiny for each of us, there is no such thing as robotics in Christianity. There is no such, such thing as that's just the way it's going to be regardless. There are in the realm and boundaries of destiny a thing called choice, free will, if you may. And in those bounds of that, you can choose whether or not you will come to Jesus or ignore Jesus. And regardless of your destiny, let's just put this where it's supposed to be. Regardless if you feel destined to go to heaven, if you do not make the choice to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord, and you are not born again by the water and the Spirit, and you are not washed in the blood of the Lamb and been sprinkled with His blood for cleansing, you will not go to your final destination. Say amen, somebody. Regardless of what anybody tells you, there are no such thing as this idea that you are born into salvation. And that regardless of what you do, how you act, and how much sin you commit, you are still going to go to heaven. That is a lie from the devil. I tell you that there is a walk to be walked, a life to be lived, and choices to be made. And if you make wrong choices throughout your life, regardless of what God had planned, the final destination will be hell for your life. Now, I didn't come here to preach on hell, but it is not preached enough, I feel. But here, I just want to start with disengage. To disengage means to separate oneself. Say that with me, separate. So before you can start this journey for eight weeks to learn what it means to be a disciple and then ultimately disciple others because we have been discipled, we have birth, we have birth must Wrap our minds and hearts around the idea of disengaging. You cannot serve two masters. You will either hate the one or despise the other. You will either cling to the one or shun the other. But you cannot serve two masters. The old times used to preach, you cannot straddle the fence. You cannot be God's child and the world's child. You can
cannot be Satan's object of affection and Jesus' object of affection. You cannot date Satan six days a week and be his disciple, Jesus' disciple, on Sunday. Say amen, somebody. So the first order of business of discipling and you knowing and being and becoming a disciple. And I said it last week. Disciples are not born. They are made. You are called and then you are made and taught and transformed into a disciple. Yes. It is not automatic. Matter of fact, when you become a Christian, you don't automatically, you don't automatically overnight become a disciple. It takes teaching and prayer, not a trial and error. Matter of fact, I go to far to say a lot of trials and terror Amen. causes you to learn how to be a disciple. So walking with Jesus is not a is not a sprint; it is a marathon. Amen. You is this ain't a hundred yard dash. This is a marathon you are in. It is getting up every day determining that I am disengaging. Say that with me, disengage. I am going to disengage from this life and this world. Matter of fact, 2 Corinthians, write this down. First order of business. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says to us in that chapter, he says to him, that, uh, to us, Paul says to the church at Corinth, who is having a very hard time disengaging from the world. They are gifted with spiritual gifts, but they are still bound in their flesh. Can I get an amen from somebody? They speak in tongues, they prophesy, but they got some lust issues. I mean, they cast out devils and they, their church is growing, but some of the women are not acting like they should. Oh, it's quiet here now, isn't it? Uh, the, the, the church is growing and the pastor is leading them, but it is in the center of a self-centered city. Sin city is all around them. And while they are determined to be his disciples, Satan is, is determined to keep them his. Let me just tell you here today, if you don't think Satan is going to let you leave his territory that easy, if you think he's going to let you leave that easy, you've got another fault coming. Because it's going to take time and determination to disengage from the world and continue on to be a disciple of Jesus. This isn't about coming to the altar and having some oil on your head and taking a pill and everything's all right until the Lord comes. You will be tempted and you will be tried and you will at times feel like engaging with the things around you. But you have to have determination to be his disciple. Amen. Disengage. 2 Corinthians 6 says, I believe, come out from among them and be ye separate. Everybody say separate. separate. The word disengage, that word, that word separate is fostered by that word. Disengage means to be separated. Come out from among them and be separate, saith God. I like this. Here's the mandate now from God. Now that you have been separated, what I do? Now that I've got born again, Pastor, what I do? Now that I've come out from the world, I don't understand all this. I don't understand how Jesus saved me. I don't even know why he saved me. I don't understand the power of the blood and how he's cleansed me and made me whole. But I know I'm different, so now what do I do? The mandate is simple. Now that I've been disengaged, he says, now do not touch the unclean thing. Then I will receive you. The idea is, once you have disengaged, stay disengaged. Once you have been separated from a life of sin, do not entertain them things ever again. Or you will find yourself retrapped in that that you claim you came out of. Matter of fact, the Bible teaches us that Jesus said to his disciples that when the evil spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, the evil spirit. 
He says, looking for rest but finding none. He coming back to the vessel that he came out of. The Bible said that he found the vessel, Jesus said, swept and garnished. It was clean, it just didn't have nothing in it. Oh my God. It was clean, it just didn't have nothing. It's possible to be clean and still be empty. Discipleship is about being clean and, be, and putting something in there where something has been taken out. So once you disengage from the world, you have to replace what you've done with another, some other activity. If you danced in the nightclub with your friend, then I'm sure, surely you've got to find some other friends to dance in church with. If you, if you serve Satan with, with all that is in you, then you cannot relax in your devotion to God. You've got to serve God. So once you disengage, you have to deposit. Say that with me. Deposit. Once you disengage, you have to deposit or let God deposit. His good spirit, anointing, and word in your life. One man said to me one time in my office, he said, Pastor Napier, I have a hard time going back into sin. Is there anything I can do to keep from falling into sin? I said, yes, sir. He said, what is that? I need to pray three or four hours a day. I said, you can. That'll help. But really, you need more than that. He said, what's that? I said, the psalmist said, I'm going to hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I did. Once you become empty and disengaged from the world, you have to immediately begin discipleship. Learning how to study. Learning how to walk. I'm amazed at the young Christians that think they can tell 40 or 50 year old Christians that they know more than them. You do not. I said you do not. Being a young Christian is like being a baby. You learn how to walk first. Matter of fact, you learn how to crawl. Then you learn how to walk. Then you learn how to talk. Somebody say amen. And as you develop, you grow. As you grow, you develop into a young person and then to an adult person and then maturity comes. It's the same process and principle with Christianity. There is no such thing as overnight successes in the kingdom of God. So I've disengaged and now I have to have depositing into my life. It is to your best interest that once you disengage, you need to engage yourself into a fellowship. You need to be a part of a church that preaches the gospel, that teaches the truth. Because if you're not very soon after disengagement, you'll find the allurement of going back into what you came out of very tempting. And unfortunately, many times there are a lot of people leave and go right back into what they were doing. The finalization of that spirit that was walking on out of the man. The Bible said he seeketh, seeketh rest and findeth none, returneth to the vessel, only to find his swept and garnished and envy. When he found it empty, guess what? He went in and invited seven more spirits worse than himself in there with him. So the latter part of that man's life was worse than the beginning. In other words, don't get saved and get out because if you get saved and go back, it can be worse the next time. Discipleship is about leaving behind whatever is there and not returning to it. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. Leaving it totally behind. Look at some scripture with me. Found in Luke 14. Luke chapter 14 and then I'll be going to Philippians chapter 3. Disengage and desperate. Disengage. I'm not through raining this turnip out yet. I want to. Smash it a little long. Jesus said in verse 25 of Luke 14, How great, now the great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters, and yes, and his own life, also he cannot be my disciple. Some of y'all said, Oh my. 
I don't think I've ever read that. Maybe not quite like that. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, and yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. The word hate there in our time and now is a very strong, candid word. It brings animosity when it is spoken. But here the word hate literally means to write this down. Hate here means to love less. Not with the anger and animosity that it is in our culture, culture. When we say the word, I hate you, or we tell that to somebody, it, it brings the very raw feelings out of us. Have you ever heard, you ever had somebody just look at you and say, I hate you? It does something to you. It doesn't matter how close you are to God or how, how, how mature you are or how things are going in your life good. Uh, uh, you can be on top of the world. When that word is given to you, uh, there's something about it that just brings a shock. It brings hurt, pain. Here Jesus is not saying, I want you to hate them. He's saying, I want you to hate them. There's a difference. I want you to love them less. He's saying that I. And not, he's not saying to not to love them. He's saying to love them less than you love me. Now, now hear me. Now, now this has been great discussion and great debate throughout the year in, in evangelical circles and churches and denominations. What do you really mean by this? And some people go crazy with this. They get the idea that he literally means hate them. Don't have anything to do with them. Well, my God, we'd never have any evangelism at all if we became haters of all them that are in the world. Can it? Somebody say amen. I mean, if we hated our family like this, we, 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 it may seem he's saying here and he's not, but if we hated them and hated the world and hated everyone around us, then all we would be was full of bitterness instead of full of love. And that's what, that is not what Jesus is trying to teach to his disciples and those who are wanting to be his disciples. So here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. Before you get a position in the church and before you can be used by God and before uh, any of those things take place and you find your spiritual giftings, there is, a, there is a time in your life that you've got to come to grips with the idea that Jesus is going to either be number one in my life or he can't be anything. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. And, I, and if I had to walk around this room here today and ask you, has he always been numero uno in your life? If you said yes, I dare say I need to preach online next week. There are times in our life where things take preeminence over the call to be a disciple. The fineries of life, the flash, the pump, the job. Oh my God, don't we talk about the money. The money, the relationships. All of them things can become priority number one if you're not careful when it comes to Jesus. Jesus is saying, when you disengage, disengage. Cut completely loose. I read a story sometime back. I love to read. I read a story, and I'm a I love the history of any kind. There was a story about Hannibal. When he was going in to fight, taking his troops over to fight, as he was taking them over, the story said, the history said, that as they crossed this great river and bridge, Hannibal told a regiment of his army to burn the bridge. And all of the soldiers that had went across watched and shot as their way out got burnt. Thus the saying, burning hill bridges, came about. There is a concept in Christianity that you need to know when it comes to being a disciple. There are some bridges you need to burn. Are you with me? Say amen. When you disengage, you need to burn the route back to the issues. You need to burn that road back to the sin. You need to stay as far away as you can from that. Because if you're not careful, the 
allurement of that will finally catch up with you. One man said to me one time, after coming to Jesus very shortly, I was pastoring another church. He came to me, he was an alcoholic, he'd gotten saved, he'd gotten better. I mean, he was free from alcoholism. But I never forget what he came to me and asked me. He said, I go to work every day. And he said, the funny thing is, I have to drive by that liquor store to get to my work. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, is that the only road to your work? He said, no. I said, I suggest taking another route. He said, I see the wisdom in that. I said, hey, if you get yourself that close every day, guess what? Every day when you ride by that liquor store, the devil's going to jump in the front seat and say, you know, you've got time to get you a half a pint before you go into work today. But if you route, reroute your life and don't even go by there, guess what? Out of sight out of mind. Sooner or later you'll have a new routine. Sooner or later the devil will have to tempt you with something else because you now not only have disengaged but you're depositing something else inside of your life and you're going in a different direction thus that's what discipleship is all about. Is leaving one thing and embracing something else. Jesus says you gotta hate Your father, your mother, your wife, your children, brothers and sisters, love them less. Love them less. Say that with me. Love them less. Disengage. Deposit. Love less. Love less. It mean I didn't need to love them. I'm supposed to love them. I'm supposed to pray for them. But when it comes to the, when it comes to the person that it, that is number one in my life, the one that saved me, cleansed me, sanctified me, Holy Ghost baptized me, wrote my name down in the Lamb Book of Life, there is no one. I mean, absolutely no one that can take His place. Amen. Okay. Now that I've become disengaged, what's the next order of business? Depositing. After you've departed, you've got to deposit. Now, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Oh, here we go again. Point number two. You've got to love less those who, with everything in you, wants to love more than anything else. Come on. And if that wasn't hard enough to accomplish, Jesus said, now take that cross up that only you can tote because that's yours. You can't tote mine and I can't tote yours. Every person and every disciple of Jesus has their own cross to bear. He says that if you can't carry your cross and tote your cross and bear your cross, guess what? This could cancel out discipleship one-on-one for you. This could eliminate this class. Have you ever been you know, have you, has, has anybody, how many college people we got out? Ever been to college at all? When you come out of high school and then you went to college. High school, man, did you notice high school and college was two different things? You had the mindset it was the same, but it was the different. You know how it was different? In high school, you got somebody to check on you if you ain't there. And if you ain't there, they call your mom and dad. And if your mom and dad gets wind of that, they're going to tear your tail up. And you're going to go back to school. Have you ever noticed in college, though, you can show up to class or not? They don't really care if you come. As long as you pay the money, you can skip every time. But they're going to fail you, too. You're going to make straight F's all the way through. So the concept here is you graduated from high school, maturity. You, 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 you taken something else on and now there are responsibilities that you have to engage in and you can't wait on somebody to give you a phone call discipleship is more than just somebody fixing pies for you on Friday inviting you back to church on Sunday if discipleship is just that then we are poor in our discipleship and in our, in our discipling of the world but here's the thing when you become disengaged yes you become disengaged and the deposit of God gets inside of your life early on it doesn't take long for this you to figure this out that I need to be a part of that and when you really embrace discipling and really embrace discipleship guess what really no one should have to call you no one should have to send you a letter no one should have to email you where are you at 
What is going on? You should be here. Discipling is accepting responsibility for your own actions. And the older you get with Jesus, guess what? That, respon that responsibility heightens to a word that everybody hates called accountability. Come on. You're not only responsible, now you're accountable. Now that I've disengaged, I've got a cross. That cross represents something. That cross represents a person. That cross represents an institution, a, a church, a body. And what I do now reflects not only Jesus, but on them. So here's the thing. Please don't cuss somebody out in the DMV and tell them you go to Sweetwater Church of God. Please don't steal something out of Walmart and they catch you. And when they handcuff you, say, let me call my pastor, Brother Napier. There is a responsibility with being a disciple. And it is to do right and to live right. And you may not have all of those things in order at all times. But guess what? Early on in Christianity, how many figured this much out? That it didn't take long for you to figure out there were some things that were right and to do. And there were some things that was wrong to do. And you didn't have to go to class for 10 weeks or 8 weeks or 100 weeks or a whole year to figure that out. Or for God to let you know that. You become disengaged from responsibility else for bearing your cross. For which you attend in building a tower. Does not sit down first and count the call. Whether you have enough to finish it. Lest after you've laid the foundation. And is not able to finish it all. Who see it begin to mock him. Does that sound like some people's life? You begin. You started the race. Why didn't you finish it? A lot of people like to start things. They just don't like to finish what they start. Well, come on. They big on ideas. Oh, we need, if we do this and get that building over there and buy that property there, my God, we'd have a great ministry. Then when you ask them, will you run it? Oh, no. Come on. Kind of reminds me of the chicken and the pig. Church is full of these two type people, chickens or pigs. Some of you say, I sure don't want to be a pig. You might want to hear this story before you decide you don't want to. It's chicken and the pig one day is, in the, is out in the barnyard. Here comes the farmer. He comes out the street door down the path. He comes as he sees him coming. The chicken says, oh, great. Look, here comes the farmer. I get to provide breakfast for them. Isn't that wonderful, Mr. Pig? Pig says, oh yeah, you can shout because that's just a gift from you. But for me, that's total commitment. I mean, you can give an egg here and there, and that's, that don't cost you anything. But the pig is saying, hey, if they decide they want bacon, guess what? <laughs> I'm out of here. There's two types of people in the church, chickens and pigs. Them folks who come and all they give is the deposit of what they have and it really cost them nothing more than an egg. Yeah, I'll sit over here a while and get you a couple of dozen. Enjoy them. Then there's the pigs. Who realize, man, I ain't shouting, but I know what I got to do. And I've got to lay my life down and lay it down on that altar and give it all totally so that everyone, even God, can enjoy my life regardless. Let me tell you, that's what discipleship is. It's not just giving of some, something you have. It's about giving your all to God. Mm. Mm. He says what king going to make war against another king? I've got to hurry. Does not sit down first and consider whether he be able to 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else while the other is still a great way off, sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever does not forsake. What's that three-letter word? All. Who does not forsake all cannot be my disciple. 
When you got saved, whenever that was, you may not be saved. Let me go ahead and tell you, Jesus isn't just want your problems. He's wanting your all your life. Good and bad. He wants all of you. He don't want to fix your problems and have you walk out of church after fixing your problems, living a more better, sinful life. He wants to fix your problems and you become devoted and committed to Him totally so that He can use you in your testimony to reach others and disciple them and then replicate what you have in your life. That's what discipleship is all about. <laughs> Philippians 3. Philippians chapter 3. Hallelujah. This is where I'm going to tie these two things in. Disengaged and destined. How I many is under the influence or under the impression that first order business is disengaged? Hey, you may have been saved 10 years and you ain't totally disengaged and you're, figuring, you're trying to wonder, you're wondering why God ain't used you and God hadn't touched you and, and done something with your life and called you into something or used you to make a difference. It, a lot of that's got to do with first step. Truly committing to Jesus. Why do we feel like we have the desire to hold on to both Him and the world? Why do we feel like we need to do that? When we need to let one of them go. Whosoever seeks to save his life shall. Help me Bible people in here. Whosoever seeks to save his life shall. Whosoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. So if you want to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose it, you'll find it. Jesus, how mercy. Really, that don't make no sense to everyone else. But here's the thing. You can't live two lives, ladies and gentlemen. And Jesus is saying you've got to lose one in order to gain another. But you cannot live too lie. That's why some of us, that's why some people in the church are being destroyed from the inside out. That's why they, they store up, tore up in the spirit all the time. Is because what you don't know is they're living a double life. They're constantly in upheaval in the spirit. It's because behind the scene and at home they say things, do things, and live in things that is not supportive of Christianity. I'm preaching better than you're shouting. While on the outside, while they're in the church and while they're in public, they put on the smile, they wear the clothes, they tote the Bible, they have the tag on the front of the car, they got a fish on the trunk of the car. A fish on your trunk don't mean you say it. Boy, that's a sermon, ain't it? Hmm. Be what you should be for Jesus. Chapter 3. I'm disengaged. Has something been deposited? It doesn't quit there. It keeps continuing to evolve, so to speak. And I don't like to use that word, but that's what it does. It evolves in Scripture. And when you think you're graduating from a class, you ever notice that God will put you back through the same class? Have you ever noticed that about God? When you think you're about ready for graduation, God bumps you back down. It says, hey, let's go through that class again. You say, oh, God. Mm, 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 mm. Oh, God. Verse, chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord for me. To write the same thing to you is not tedious. But for you, it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Somebody asks you what you believe, you tell them them three things. My God, I worship God in the Spirit, I rejoice in Christ Jesus, and I don't have no confidence in my flesh. Let me tell you, that's the summary of a disciple's life. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he have more confidence in the flesh, I more so. 
circumcised the eighth day, he begins to tell us why if there's any confidence in him, he says, let me read you my pedigree. He says, I was circumcised the eighth day. Of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning the law, a Pharisee concerning zeal, my God, persecution, persecuting the church concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Paul said, I ain't just a Jew. I am at the top of the list of being a Jew. I am not just a top of the list Jew. I am a teacher of the Jews. And I can tell them what's in the law. I am a Pharisee. I can quote it frontwards and backwards. When it comes to looking at me and the law, I am blameless when it comes to the law. Let me tell you. There are a lot of people who can say that today and they think they're saved because they're blameless. Yeah, but being and having all your T's dotted, uh, crossed and your I's dotted doesn't make you saved. Yeah. And doing good works doesn't get you to heaven. Yeah. And doing the right thing doesn't get you to glory. And just because you've got it all down pat doesn't mean you're washed in the blood. Somebody say amen. amen. No, no, no. Paul goes on to say this. He said, but what things were gained to me, here's the disengagement. He said, these I have counted along for what? For Christ. Here is a selfless life. Sometime back there's a man who wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Life. A lot of millions of people read it. But do you know there is something more valuable in life than purpose? Paul was not, and I know I may get some, I may get some bad looks when I when I say this, but I want you to hear me. The apostle Paul was not a purpose-driven preacher. He was a person-driven preacher. And there is something more valuable in life than purpose, and that is a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. You can have purpose and not have Christ. Do you know that? Oh my God. I'm going to preach a little while now. You can have purpose and not be born again. You can have purpose and not be saved. You can have purpose and not know the Spirit of God. You can have purpose and not own the body. But to know the person of Jesus. To know the person. See, discipling is about not learning the manual. It's learning the man. Amen. Discipleship is not about manual. It's about email. Yeah. It's not about rules. It's about relationship. Discipling is not about works. It's about righteousness in God. Without works. Hallelujah. Lord, you didn't contribute anything to it at all. It was by His grace and His love and His calling you that you are who you are. And because of that, you gladly, not regretfully disengage. You gladly disengage. One young man told me, he said, if I get saved preaching, I have to walk away from my friends. I said, if you get saved, your friends will walk away from you. <laughs> if you get saved, you won't have to worry about walking away from them. They're going to take a hike because you ain't going where they're going any longer. Disciple. Paul says, not only am I the best, not only am I good, I'm the best at what I do. But it, when it comes to putting me beside Jesus, I am nothing. And I'm not going to lean on what I know. I'm going to lean on who I know. Come on. That's true disciple. That's true disengagement. Let's read on. Let's read on. The things I counted gain I, that were gained to me, I counted lost. Yet indeed I also count all things, oh, there's that word again, all things, what? Lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And I kept them as rubbish that I might gain Christ. Paul said, I've lost it all to win Jesus. I've lost everything 
just to gain knowledge of Jesus. And he ain't regret one minute of it. I walked away from everything just to know him, just to see him, just to embrace him. And looking at what I lost and what I'm about to gain, what I lost ain't a drop in a bucket for what I'm about to get from God. See, you can't experience that until you have released the world. Some of you are struggling with things. Struggling with petty things. Finances, man. Relationship. Let me just tell y'all something right now. I'm going to give y'all some pre-marital, pre-dating, pre-relationship counsel. If you meet this young guy, Smart as a whip, good looking, needs to be in Hollywood, drives one of them fancy, dancy cars. Got money, got a job. If something comes out of his mouth like this, but I ain't going to church with you, you need to get up out the car right then. Go somewhere and call somebody you love and respect and tell them to come get you and get you away from somebody who ain't going in the same direction that you are going. Because I've had them guys walk up in my office before with their fiancés. Sometime back I had one. I put him on the spot. This has been some years ago. He come to my office. Sit back in my office. Young lady sitting there. We want to get married. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blah, blah. We love each other. I'm thinking to myself, I've seen all this before. I'm sitting there an hour, hour goes by. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know she, this one's going. He said, I know she loves God and everything loves the church. This one to come out his next mouth. I almost said it for him. And, and she can come anytime she wants to. I ain't going to get involved. I ain't going to handle none of that. I know she loves God, loves the church. She can come back here and do whatever she want to do. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I said, really? He said, yeah. Yeah, you know, man, I'm, I'm for God. I'm for God. Now, I don't come to church, but I'm for God. Really? I said, you know how long that's going to last? He said, how long? I said, about two weeks. I said, because while you at work, the devil's going to say, she's seeing somebody down there at church, don't you? She's down there, she's down there, somebody, somebody loving on her down at that church, which will be a lie. And what you're going to do instead of coming to church, you're going to tell her, I'm going to tear up all your clothes if you decide to go back down that church. I, you ain't got, I'll put you out the house. I'll beat you to an end of your life if you go back down to that church. And I said, that's what will happen. He said, I would never do that. I said, I know you would never do that, but you'll do that. Just because you ain't regenerated, you ain't got no power to resist the evil one. Man, he looked up looked at me and said, what you mean? I said, here's the deal, young man. Boy, he sat back in his chair. I said, do you want me to marry you with her? He said, yes, sir, I do. I said, then here's the only way I'm going to do it if you get saved right now. I said, because the Bible said not to be unequally yoked. And that ain't got nothing to do with color. But it's got something to do with your religion and what you believe. Hallelujah. And if you think for a minute that I'm sending her out of here and you out of here with my blessing when she wants to serve God and you don't, if you think that's going to work, your head got more holes in it than I can see. When you're a disciple for God and you're a disciple for Christ and you're on your way, you have to pick your relationships. And when them are not contingent upon bringing you closer to Jesus, regardless of what they offer you, you have to let them go and release them because you have a person in your sight and his name is Jesus and you're going to do everything you can to fulfill your destiny. Are you with me? Say amen. I'm almost through. Somebody says, I'm almost glad. To be found in him having, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, 
that I might know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death, that by any means I might obtain unto the resurrection. Hallelujah. Paul said, I want to know him. And it don't care, I don't care how much it costs me to know him. I got to know him. And I just don't want to know him. I want to know what his power is like. I want to know what raised him from the dead. I want to know what it means to fellowship with his suffering. So y'all with me say amen. How many just prayed this lately? I bet some of y'all ain't prayed this. Maybe you ain't never prayed this. Oh, I want to know you, Jesus. Have you ever prayed? I want to know what your cross felt like. I want to know what it feels like to be nailed to one. Uh, that's what Paul is saying. I just don't want to know who you are. I want to know your power. But I want to know what it felt. I want to know what suffering feels like too. So I can understand what you went through to bring me into what I'm in. I want to be a true disciple. And disengaging from the world is the first order of business. Disengage. Well, it's hard. Hey, I didn't say it was easy. I didn't say it was easy going to call that boyfriend or girlfriend up and say, can't go out with you no more. Oh, I got one better than that. When they say, why not? Tell them the preacher told me I couldn't. Give them my cell phone number. You won't have a problem with them no more. After I talk to them, you won't have no problem with them. Because here's the thing. I want you to go to heaven. And there is nothing, 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 nothing. No relationship, nobody. Nothing you can have in this life. No money, no finances, no faith. Important enough to lose your soul over. Nothing. You might have thought this is going to be just as plain old ABC simple discipleship is not. This is going to be intense. That's my next word for next week. Intense. Discipleship ain't some lame, laudering type attitude. Discipleship is intense. It takes determination. I got to finish. I'm almost done. Almost. Hmm. Not that I've already attained. I'm already perfect. But I press on that I may lay hold of that which is Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. I wish I had time. I run a reference to that scripture and it led me all the way back to the eagle concept. The mother eagle taking the eaglets out of the nest and holding them in her talons. The same talent that could destroy the eaglets with one stroke. Grasps them with love and care as she flies and soars to the thermos. Only to drop them. And if they can't fly the first time, she don't quit. Scientists said they watched mother eagles 50 times take one eagle up, drop it, go get it, drop it, go get it, drop it. Go get it, drop it, go get it, drop it, go get it, drop it, go get it. So you don't learn how to fly the first time you you jump. See, it ain't automatic. It's, <laughs> you're like, I'm big to die here. But you don't realize that someone who already knows how yeah. is going to save you in that last moment and then take you right back up to that high place and that thermal only to release you again and I'll, oh my God, you figure out the 50 times somebody be God. Is that all right? I wish I could tell you how many times he dropped me and I didn't fly. Matter of fact, there was sometimes he dropped me and I just went down like this hollering. Hey! And then he down I didn't even try to fly. I just screamed. Is that all right? I tell him I ain't got, I don't even want to fly today. If you're going to save me, it's going to be because of you. I ain't going to fly, but they did days, hallelujah, where I got hit hard. And I was looking at that mother eagle of mine, hallelujah, his name is Jesus. And I'd say, can you take me up to that thermal today? I feel like spreading my wings. That devil has been giving me a fit this week. I feel like I can fly only to have him take me up and I that's what he said I've embraced this what has already embraced me and is holding on to me brother brethren I do not count myself to have apprehended here it is disengagement but one thing I do here it is forgetting what come on somebody help me in here somebody shout it out like you know you've been disengaged Forgetting what? Those things that are where? If they're behind you, where are you at? It's you're in front of them. Forgetting them things that are behind me. Reaching for the things that are 
See, you thought it was going to be easy. All I got to do is walk away from it. Then you realize, my God, there's something out in front of me I got to reach for. And if that ain't good enough to get what I'm looking for, I got to press my way into it. Hallelujah to God. So discipleship is not easy. It is a journey. Hallelujah to God. But it is not easy. But one day as you disengage, you will embrace not only your destiny but the people you should touch in this life. But one day you will press for the last time. One day you will reach the last time. And one day you will press your way into his presence. The last time. You will say then, it was worth everything I left to have all of this. Stand on your feet. If you don't stand up, I'll keep you here. Listen, I press to the mark for the prize of the high calling or upward calling of Jesus Christ. Therefore let us as many as be mature. 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 Well, let me emphasize that. Mature. Have this mind. And if anything you think otherwise, God will Reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that you've already attained, let us walk by the same rule. And let us be of the same mind. Verse 17 to verse 21 is destiny. Get this. You disengage falsehood. I'm forgetting what's behind me, reaching to before me, pressing. Press. I'm maturing and I'm pressing. He's dropping me, but he's catching. I'm holding on, but he's holding on tighter. Are you getting it? Somebody say amen. amen. He that begun a good work and he's going to finish it. Hallelujah. It before the day of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You shall perfect that thing that concerned me, the psalmist said. Hallelujah. Hmm. Brethren, join in following my example. Here it is. Destiny is leading up to I've been discipled. Now I am going to disciple others and you should replicate discipling in others and others should do it in others and finally others in others. God did not say when you get Facebook, reach the world. <laughs> when you get the internet, reach the world. You reach the world by taking yourself in his shoes as his disciple and saying what the master would say in his absence. You are his representative. Somebody shout amen. Listen, listen, through, I'm through. Here it is. Follow my life as an example. And note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Don't walk like everybody walks. Don't do what everybody does. The them that you are following, make sure that they are truthful and they're honest, that they have a life of integrity, that they have disengaged from the world, that they're not living a double life. For many walk of whom I told you often, and now tell you again, get this, get this. They are now enemies of the. They're enemies of the. That's what you got to take up to be a disciple. In other words, Paul is saying they're, they're, they don't love the cross. They won't, follow, they won't follow Jesus. They won't take up their cross. They won't deny themselves. They are, whoo, I'm about to get real right here. They are self centered. They don't ask when they come to church, what can I do for the church? They ask, what can the church do for me? Preach on, Pastor Phil. I believe I will. They're self-centered. They won't take any job you offer them unless they can find self-gain in it. 
They're self-centered. Matter of fact, this goes on to say that. Whose God is their belly? Whose glory is in their shame? Who set their mind, here it is, on earthly things? It's all about them. It's all about them. It's all about them. A true disciple says it's all about him. It's all about him. It's all about him. A false disciple says it's all about me. It's all about me. And it's all about me. Which are you? A contributor, an egg, chicken. Are you the pig? Totally committed. Lay me on the altar. Hmm. Heard another little story my brother told me. I can't believe I'm telling this. This will make you laugh. He told me, so I went by a house not long ago, brother. He said, Philip. So I looked out in the yard and there was a three-legged pig standing in the yard. I said, oh my God, I've never seen nothing like it. I said, I got out, went and knocked on the farmer's house. He said, what's up with the three-legged pig? He said, man, ain't he wonderful? He said, man, he's beautiful. got three legs. What's up with that? He said, man, I pig that good. You can't eat him all one time. I said, you know, that's wrong in all kind of ways right there. Sometimes I feel like though that serving God takes a little here and a little there. Until so that one day totally we are committed and consumed with his presence. Final words. He says this. For our citizenship, here's the destiny. Our citizenship is in heaven. For which we also eagerly wait for the Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ. Who will transform our lowly body and then be conformed to his glorious body. According to the working by which he himself is able to do all things to him. Self disengage in my destiny. And in order for me to embrace my destiny, I've got to disengage from the world. Would you agree this morning? Romans 12 and 1. I wasn't planning on reading this or saying it, quite quote it to you. Romans 12 and 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. That you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Disengaged. Present your body. Give yourself to God. He goes on to say, Be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen. Disengage is all over that. Disengage from the world. Engage God. Here comes destiny. Once you disengage from the world, give yourself as a sacrifice. You give your mind, let it be purged again. Hallelujah. You repenting. Everything is being cleansed for a purpose. The purpose is found in the next few words after that. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? The will of God is destiny. But you can't prove the destiny of God for your life until you disengage from the world. That means coming out. That means letting it go. That means walking away from all of it. How many can say this morning, I want to go through with this eight weeks. This is the beginning. But before I can appreciate the next seven weeks, I've got to make sure priority is set in place. I am disengaging from the world. And you may say, hey, I'm not saying you're not a Christian because Christians can be entangled in things they don't need to be entangled in. Galatians 6, come on now, one. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Come on, somebody. Stand fast in the liberty of heaven and Christ hath made you free. Paul wrote to Timothy and Second Timothy, he says, He that is a good soldier don't entangle himself with the affairs of this life. If you're going to fight the good fight and be a disciple, then you've got to let go of the things you're trying to hold on to. And I guarantee you, they people on the side of my bones, regardless of how much we lift our hands and how much we shout and how much we claim. And you may not have any of that. There are things we hold on to we don't need to be holding on to. And we need to let them go.